Uh, and I talked about barrenness from the, 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 the mindset of um, being unfulfilled desires, unfulfilled expectations. And um, that when we are intimate with God, our motivation actually changes. And our motivation actually aligns with God's heart and our heart. And so it is in the pursuit of God that things actually begin to line up with the things of God. And so I've used a scripture this morning that you all are very familiar with, uh, but I'm going to talk about it a little, little differently. And uh, I I'm, 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 will probably say something that, that sounds crude. It's not meant to be crude, but you'll see the, the connection. Um, let's look at Mark 5. Verse 25, it says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in a crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in herself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her, and yet, and he had done the, who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This number 12, and I, while I didn't read it, there's another story that's sort of in sync with this story about a little girl who was 12 years old. The so number 12 in scripture represents God's power, God's authority, and his government, okay? His power, his authority, and his government. And one of the things that we see that's interesting is that this woman is actually going to come into intersection with the government of God, the power of God, and the authority of God, okay? Uh, let's look at um, Isaiah 9. We usually read this around Christmas time. Verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so here's what we see. We see a prophetic word from Isaiah about Jesus, and he's saying that, the government will be on him. And so here's Jesus. Remember in Matthew, he comes on the scene, sort of taking the baton from John the Baptist, and he begins to preach, repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. What he's saying is that I've got my government with me. Right? I've got my government with me. I've got my government, my power, and my, my authority with me. And when that happens, then what we see, certainly in the, in the Gospels, is what the government of God is all about. Okay, so here is this woman who is going to have uh, an encounter with Jesus and his government. Because this woman had been bleeding for 12 years, she was barren. She was barren. 12 years of bleeding, barren, no children. 
doesn't say if she was married, doesn't say if she even wanted kids. What it does, what we do know, is that she was barren. And uh, the reality for her was she couldn't have children if, even if she wanted to have children. Uh, oftentimes in scripture, uh, women represent Israel, women represents the church. And I think in this case, it represents Israel because as I read, it says, daughter, go your way because you've been healed, right? So there is a representation of her as it relates to Israel. And there's a lesson to be learned about her situation for all of Israel. And that's what I want to spend some time talking about this morning. Uh, let's turn to Isaiah 64, 6. It says, but we are all like an unclean thing. All of our righteousness says, plural, all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Okay, here's the crude part. This phrase, are like filthy rags, when you study that in the Hebrew, what it means is a woman's menstrual cloth. And here's what the Bible is saying. He's saying self-righteousness, your righteousness, is like a woman's menstrual cloth. If you want to know what God thinks about your righteousness. So here's this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. Here's the interesting thing that, that, that we see is this is a picture of self-righteousness. This is a picture of a woman's self-righteousness. Well, 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 what really is self-righteousness? Well, it's this. It's when we choose, choose not to trust God and live life on our own terms. And thinking that in doing so, somehow we can meet God's approval. It's me saying, God, I'm not going to trust you with my life. I'm not going to trust you with the life of my children. I'm not going to trust you with my job situation. I'm not going to trust you with my money. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to trust all of these things with, with, with me. And somehow in doing that, that we think we're going to gain his approval. That's self-righteousness. We just read the scriptures that our self-righteousness is like filthy rags to God. Remember when Jesus was going to the temple, he and the disciples, he goes to, or he sees a fig tree in the distance. And it's in bloom. It's got leaves, even though it's out of season. And he goes to get some fruit off of it. When he goes there, he realizes that it doesn't have any fruit. And he curses it. And so, you know, there's this, there's this thing in, in Scripture called the, the law of first mention. And so when you first see fig tree, fig leaves, is in Genesis. After Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. The reason why God cursed it, Jesus cursed it, is because it gave a representation of something that it was not. And so what Adam and Eve were trying to do, they were trying to cover their shame and their sin to give a representation that they, that they couldn't give because they had sinned. So what did God do? He killed an animal. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So he covered the animal, cut the skin away from the animal, and covered them with skin from the animal. They were trying in their own selves to cover themselves, and it doesn't work. 
So when we choose not to trust God and we try to do it ourselves, what we're saying to God is, I'm going to look to me to do this. And this, this, num this, this, this word righteousness says is because it could be any different thing in our life. It doesn't have to just be one thing. It could be many things. God, I'm not, I'm not going to trust you in this. I'm going to do this myself. And here's a woman who, here's what I believe, you know, I, I waited on God because you can read all kind of stuff. And you, I said, Lord, give me a revelation and understanding about what's happening. Well, here's what we know. We know that during this time, the law was in effect. Uh, and so because she had been bleeding for so long, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the synagogue and the, and, and the temple, they probably went to her and they said, look, you are unclean. You can't come out in public, and you certainly can't come to the synagogue. You certainly can't come to the temple, right? That would be us saying, you can't come to church because you're unclean. So here's what she tries to do. She tries to figure out a way to get clean herself. So what happens? She takes all her money over the course of 12 years and figures out a way, or at least tries to figure out a way to work with doctors to get clean. I am going to take my money and work with these doctors, and I'm going to get clean. I'm going to take my money and these doctors and get clean. Here's what happened. She got poor. She became an outcast. Her, her situation, her sickness, actually grew worse. This is, this is the result of, of self-righteousness. Poverty. Poverty is a, is a, is a sign of self-righteousness. Sickness and disease can be. I'm not saying everybody who gets sick is in self-righteousness, but it's certainly an effect. Being an outcast, feeling like you don't measure up. And so because this woman feels condemned, she feels like she's got to do something to get right. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. Because she felt condemned because of the Pharisees. They condemned her. Her, her, her. Her, her desire wasn't to run to God. Her desire was to run to the doctors and use her money to try to get well. So she's saying, I'm going to do this myself. This is the whole problem with Israel. This is why Jesus says, repent, because there's a new kingdom, a, a, a kingdom of grace, a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of love that's here. So you don't have to try to do it by yourself. I'm here to help you. So she comes to the end of herself. How many know that God is always trying to bring us to the end of ourselves? Yeah. Here's what I've learned. Just give up. <laughs> Stop fighting God and just surrender. Just throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. <laughs> and say, God, I give up. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, take myself, my family, my loved ones, the people I threw a whole host of exercise only to be somewhere else that I don't want to be in poverty, in lack of health, and an outcast because I'm still relying on self. I give up today. And that's what he's waiting for. He, he's not going to force himself on us. And so when this woman had no more money, and when she had been living in her house for 12 years by herself, she finally realized 
you know, I heard about this guy named Jesus, and he's doing some cool stuff. He's healing folks, and he's healing leprosy, and people's ears are growing again, and all kind of things. I need to go find him. Because I believe that if I just touch his robe, I'll be clean. All right, let's look at Isaiah 61. Verse 10 it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as the bride adorns herself with her jewels. He has clothed me with righteousness. Here's, here's the beautiful thing about his righteousness. When we come to him and we give our life to him, here's what happens. He takes off of us our sin. He takes it off. And he wraps it around himself. And he takes off his robe of righteousness, and he wraps it around us. So now there's been this divine exchange. I've got his righteousness, and he's got my sin. He didn't do anything to earn my sin, and I didn't do anything to earn his righteousness. But because God loves us so much, I got it as a gift. So now I'm clothed in righteousness. I no longer am a sinner. Listen, even if I sin, I can bark, but that doesn't make me a dog. Even even when I sin, I'm not a sinner. Because sin has been removed from me, and now I'm clothed in his righteousness. So now I am the righteousness of God. And this woman says, look, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be OK. So she goes and finds him and just touches his robe. And immediately, the blood flow stops. 12 years of bleeding. And just like that, seeing God, touching God, Jesus, it stops. It's over. This is, this is the power. This is the authority. This is the kingdom of God in action. Doesn't matter what you've been going through. Doesn't matter how long you've been going through it. That when you encounter God, when you encounter Jesus, when you encounter his love, his grace, his mercy for you, his authority and his power, your situation can change. Just like that. Just like that. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how long you've been in it. Doesn't matter what you thought about it. So now, when she touches this robe, she, in a sense, is being clothed in righteousness. This is, this is what God is wanting for Israel. Not, not religion, not legalism. He's wanting a relationship with them that comes through grace, the grace of God. And this woman is representing this, and all of her issues represent having been in that condition, the condition of self-righteousness, of not trusting God, not believing God for your situation, not believing God for your life. But when she decides to trust him, 
it changes. It changes. Um, we know this because I talk about it all the time, but I just want you to see it. Matthew 6.33. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom, his government, and his righteousness. His righteousness is part of his government. And everything else will come to you because you aligned your priorities. You got your priorities straight. When we get our priorities straight with God, there isn't anything that God doesn't want to do for us or, or will do for us. We just got to align ourselves the right way. How do I say this? Why on earth Think about this. Why on earth, given this situation and the effects of this, why on earth would you want to have your own righteousness? Why? Why, why on earth would you want to leave, live life on your own terms and not God's? Why would, why would you want to do that? that that's, a, that's, a, that's a real question that we have to sort of think, think about and then we have to make a, a conscious decision to say, I'm not living like that anymore. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm done living my way. Yeah. Living my way will keep me barren. Living, living my way will, 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 will have all these adverse effects of my life that I don't want. But when I live his way, when I, when I clothe myself with his righteousness, when I, when, I, when I put forth his kingdom, his government into my life and work through that government, it has an effect in my life. So in verse 34 of that scripture, The one in Mark, it reads like this. And he said to her, her, he is Jesus, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your inf affliction. That's interesting that he would say that. Go in peace and be healed. Well, wasn't she already healed? Right? She was already healed. Why, why would he say, and be healed? He, she's already healed. Okay, so this word, this phrase, be healed, is, it's, it's, it's like a, a always and forever healing. Amen. Be continuously healed. There's something about this woman that is in fear. She's fearful. Have you ever had a, have you ever had a, a situation or a condition or a mindset so long that when it changed, you still felt the effects of having it. Amen. And you're sort of looking over your shoulder, yeah. thinking that it's going to come back. Yeah. This is what this woman is thinking. And Jesus is he's led by the Holy Spirit. He sees that this woman is still fearful, even though she's healed. And he says to her, the first thing he says to her, go in peace. That phrase means... Step into peace. Step into peace. And you will have continuous healing. 
Don't step into fear, because that's where she's come from. Anxiety, lack of trust. Step into peace. Now, that, this word peace, it means prosperity, because she had lost all of her money. Health and wholeness, because she had been sick for 12 years. And Jesus is saying, step into prosperity. Step into your health and your wholeness perpetually, forever. Step into that. Essentially, what he's saying is, it's all going to be restored to you. Every dime that you lost, every, 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 every difficult day you had because of your sickness, it's all going to go away. Amen. And you'll walk in complete health forever. But you've got to step into your peace. You've got to step into it. And so this woman, fearful, because her condition had been going on for so long, just like Jesus, to be able to speak the words to her that relieves her of her anxiousness and her fear. Go in peace. Because you, you've got a perpetual healing. And here's what I believe. I believe we have to live like God says we are. The Bible says, call those things that are not as though they were. And we have to live the way we believe we are. You hear me say this all the time. Our thinking needs track shoes because our thinking has to catch up with our spirits. Our spirits move a lot faster than our thinking. So we got to get our thinking some Nikes and say, catch up. Because our spirit can get it, but our spirits have to help our mind. And when our mind can get it, boy, then everything begins to happen. Because now I actually live according to what I believe. And when I live according to what I believe, then God can enter in and do whatever he wants to do, whatever I'm asking him to do, because I believe now. And so this woman, this, this, this story of this woman is a story about the, the divine exchange from self-righteousness to his righteousness, the righteousness of God. And she's a picture for Israel to see who's been living like this, who's been hemorrhaging, that it can stop. This is the time. This is, this is the season. This is the, the encounter that you have with Christ to stop the hemorrhaging. We don't have to live the way we used to live, relying on ourselves anymore. That, that's a great relief. Because I am so limited, it's ridiculous how limited I am. I can't even get out of the bed without the grace of God. So for me, to, for me to live my life relying on self, I'm setting my life up for just disappointment. Disappointment. God never wanted us to live our lives for self, in self, out of self, through self. He's always wanted us to live our life in him. That everything that he's called for our life, we can actually have and be. And so now this woman's got the great exchange of the robe of righteousness. And she's thrown off the filthy rags of her own righteousness. It's a beautiful thing. 
It's a beautiful thing. Satan, let me just say this, Satan will come to your ear and he will say, you are no good. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. There's no good thing in you. And then what do we try to do? We try to fix it. And we try to use willpower. My willpower to fix it. And then we say this to ourselves, when I fix it, then I'll go and have a relationship with God. Dude, you, you never come in then because you can't fix it. It was never meant for you to fix. And so that line of deception takes us further and further away from God and into more of whatever we're into. And we're bound to repeat whatever it is we're doing because there's no effort, no divine effort, spiritual effort that comes, in, comes from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to actually help us. It's all on us. And so while I'm failing miserably, here's the best thing I can do. While I'm failing miserably, the best thing I can do is to say, I am the righteousness of God. While I'm failing miserably, I am the righteousness of God. That's who I am. So who I am and what I do don't match. That actually enables, enables me to come out of what I was in because now I realize that's not who I am. I'm the righteousness of God. I should live like this. So it's not, it's not willpower. It's his power Amen. working in and through us because of who we are, not because of what we do. That's, that's, that's our life in him. That's our life in him. And as we live our life with him, it becomes second nature, second nature, second nature. So that, that, that's, just, that's just who we are. And there isn't many things then Satan can do to us because we're confident in who we are, who he's called us to be. So now this woman is free to go wherever she wants to go. Hey, everybody, I know I haven't seen y'all in 12 years. I'm back. I had a little issue, but it got worked out. Praise the Lord. Yeah. She's back. She, she, she's back with a, a new understanding about the love of God and the grace of God. The, 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 the ministry is the ministry of God's goodness. It's his grace. God isn't, God isn't ready to pound on us because we do something wrong. I would challenge all of you Go look at the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see if Jesus rebuked anybody because of their sin. It's not in scripture. He didn't say to the tax collector, you low down, dirty dog. You, you are cheating all these people. Get out of my face. He didn't say to the prostitute. Mm -hmm. You've been tricking all over the place. <laughs> Get out of here. He didn't, say, he didn't say to the man who had leprosy, I ain't trying to touch you. He didn't condemn anybody. He loved them all. And here's the beautiful thing. Here's the beautiful thing. First, he healed them. Then he instructed them. He told the woman who was caught in adultery, nobody condemns you. I don't even condemn you. Go your way. 
Then he said, stop this behavior. It's after he pardoned her that he told her. He didn't lead with, well, what you been doing? Why you been doing that? He pardoned her first. He told the man who was after 38 years, right, who, who was uh, 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 invalid for 38 years uh, on the five porches, he healed him. He saw the man several days later in the temple. He told the man after he healed him, stop sinning because something worse could happen to you. He healed him first. What he demonstrated was the love of God, the grace of God, then the instruction of God. And this has to be our heart for people. This has to be our heart for each other, is you will get grace, you will get mercy, and you will get instruction. But the instruction doesn't come first. Who, who can't receive that? Let's stand.